Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing well. Today I am joined by a very special green guest because I am really excited about this video. I'm sure it comes as no surprise that I am a massive Star Wars fan and therefore also a massive Mandalorian fan. Now last year I ended up making the Mandalorian's helmet, also this green bean, but this year I really wanted to try and take it one step further. When I did that helmet video last year, the Mandalorian hadn't even premiered yet. I was working off of like two reference photos and just generally not a lot of information to go off of when trying to replicate a screen accurate costume piece. But now that there is all of that information, I know I could do a much better job. But I don't just want to stop at remaking the helmet. So this year we are making an entire life-size Mandalorian bust. So here we have Mando on the left and I wanted to just do a rough sketch sort of explaining exactly what it is I want to build. Now there's a lengthy explanation as to how I got to this point so I'm not going to get into that but essentially what I want to make is a life-size bust. I'm just really feeling like making more armor. I wanted to make something more than just the helmet so I figured this concept was the perfect opportunity to do that. So first off, please excuse the extensively rough sketching. This will most likely be the worst drawing you've ever seen me do on my channel. But of course, the first and arguably main part of this bust is in fact a new helmet, which I'm normally really not super into redoing pieces of costumes that I've already built, but pretty much as soon as I finished building that helmet, I was very much ready and willing to remake it and remake it a lot better. And I very specifically want to be making this bust the Beskar armor and possibly leaning in towards if there are any changes in the season 2 promo pictures and stuff that they've been releasing. So at the very least end of season 1 Beskar armor leaning possibly if there are minute changes into season 2. Because technically the helmet that I've already made could be considered the version 1 of the helmet. It has a lot more dirt uh, detailing on it so this is going to be pretty clean up Beskar throughout the whole thing. So moving on from the helmet directly under that you of course have the cape and pauldrons. And because I want this bust to be the most updated version of Din Djarin's armor there will be the mudhorn signet on the one pauldron. The chest plate is actually what helped me come up with the size and I guess finishing point of this bust. The chest plate has this really good cutoff point at the bottom where it starts to taper in and those flat fins come off of it. Uh, so I'm going to be cutting off those elongated fin pieces that are on like the most outer side. And I thought I was going to stop just with the upper chest plate, but I thought it might look a little weird. So I'm going to cut the stomach plate off so it lines up at that point as well. And then of course have all of the soft goods to match that cutoff point. So there will be some form of flak vest, the cape, some parts of the flight suit, and the belt. The only thing that I have executively decided not to include is the possible jetpack, just because it would make the overall dimensions of this already extremely large project just way too big in the back. Plus there is somewhat a matter of debate whether he will actually always have that jetpack on or whether he will be sort of taking it on and off and therefore this is also a perfectly accurate representation of what he might look like for a large majority of season two. The first step in this Mando bust building process was figuring out what 3D print files I wanted to use and get them all set up to start being printed. I'm lucky enough to have access to this technology quite literally in my closet, so I wanted to use it to its fullest extent for the armor pieces. I ended up not adjusting the scale of any of the pieces because they were apparently natively sized to the actual on-screen measurements, and since I'm making all of this as a display piece, accurate fitting to a specific person wasn't going to be an issue. Although looking into it, all of these pieces should actually fit me perfectly. I got the helmet printing first because it was by far the largest and most time consuming piece. I did decide to print it all in one piece because I could and there was really no reason to separate it. So the helmet and all of the larger pieces were printed on my Creality CR-10S with a 0.8 millimeter nozzle. And some of the more detailed pieces like the helmet ears and some of the belt pieces I printed on my Ender 3 Pro. 
Most of the pieces did end up getting printed in black PLA. It's just my typical for helmets. I like the black. It looks great on the inside and I don't have to generally worry about painting it or what it looks like later because it's all nice and dark and looks great. For the chest and stomach plate, I did need to make some more modifications to that. I had to actually edit the 3D data, so I did slice those end bits off of the chest plate on either side and then also slice the stomach plate at the same point um, so that it was in line with those to give it a nice cohesive cutoff zone. And then once I had those pieces modified, I then prepped them to start printing. So uh, clearly this is not a full chest plate and things clearly did not exactly go as planned, uh, but somehow this knocked itself off of the print bed. There's a variety of reasons that it can do that. Honestly, it's just a combination of different events. It probably in theory hit itself and just it just wasn't sufficient enough adhesion for one reason or another because it was printing kind of on an angle. The big uh, print bed on my big printer is pretty uh, wobbly, uh, which it does have a BL touch on it and it should counteract that, but it does kind of curl up in certain places, which could have something to do with it. Regardless, clearly this did not finish printing, but I figured this would instead of just going ahead and possibly making some modifications to the print file that could ultimately result in the same problem happening, I would just, you know, use this piece, not waste the plastic, and print the remainder. And I figured this would be an interesting, teachable moment of what I do when something like this happens. Uh, so there is a bit of stuff at the top here that I'm going to clean up, but basically, I take a caliper if it's not too big. I think this is going to be just the right size to do this for. Take a caliper, measure exactly how tall it is from, you know, the very bottom of the print job to where it failed or whatever happened to it. Measure that and then basically sink the print in Cura into the bed that amount so that the upper part basically it resumes printing exactly where it failed. Because this is now perfectly flat on the top, I'm probably going to be putting a raft on it just to counteract for the waviness of my print surface so that they, they will meet as flush as possible. Uh, but because I'm making this, it's like a perfect metal chest plate. I'm going to be doing a lot of post-processing anyway, so there being this random seam, not even like in the center, it's like three quarters of the way uh, down because this is actually the chest plate the other way. This is the chest plate right side up. Um, it's like three quarters of the way down. Uh, not going to be a problem. going to be able to hide that seam very easily and make it nice and strong like you would never know without wasting any of this plastic. I did also print the bottom plate or like the partial uh, stomach plate or whatever you call this piece uh, which printed perfectly fine. It's not a very tall piece compared to the other so absolutely did not have any issues completing that without failure. So here is the bottom part of the chest plate on its raft. I'm going to pop this off and we're going to see how well this fits with the other piece. Rafts tend to be really easy to pop off and this one's no exception. It's just a little stuck on some of the edge bits here. So other than the few little bits around the edge that came off pretty clean and this piece and this piece, yeah, match up pretty good it seems like. Definitely going to need to like sand it down to get it to fit nice and flush between the two, but I think that's going to work really nicely and it appears that I did get it to sit down at the appropriate spot. There's definitely like way more uh, little bits on this piece that I need to remove so that it actually fits more flush than it is right now. And here is the fully finished printed Mandalorian helmet. This miraculously only took like 42 and a half hours, which if you've tried to 3D print a helmet in one piece, you know that's an incredibly short amount of time. If you're using like a 0.4 millimeter nozzle, these things can take like six days. So 42 hours is really, really good. Honestly, it could have been even less, but I did keep some conical support material in the middle there. I'm not sure if you can see like black on black, 
back in shadowy conditions there you can see. So a little bit in the center still just because I was paranoid about the pop section and I did like simulate what it would print like without it and it wasn't an incredibly long amount of time and or material so I decided to keep that in there. I also have all of the pieces printed so I sent all of the uh, detailed pieces so you have the ears for either side like the bottom parts of the ears the inner ear pieces the outer ear top pieces and the back vent printed all of those on one of my smaller printers that have a 0.4 millimeter nozzle on it still just for the added detail in the you know fine areas just really try and get a little bit uh, more detail in the print than my bigger nozzle might have done other than it also sped up the process because I didn't need to wait for the helmet to finish printing to get all of these done in the same amount of time. Of course all of these pieces still have their support structure on them and I figured I would take that off on camera to show you what it's like and then possibly look at some minimal cleanup. I feel like the biggest trick for support material cleanup is to really nail your settings. It helps an incredible amount, but other than that, because you will inevitably need to use support material for the overhang sections and just to generally help the print succeed, I use various pliers and if I need it, knives to cut any of it off, but this was pretty easy in terms of support material cleanup. Everything pretty much popped off. The rafts came off really nicely. You do definitely need to be careful though in some of the more delicate areas, like for instance on the helmet, the visor, because it was all intermingled to create the visor shape. Um, just being gentle with removing that before I accidentally cracked the entire print somewhere where I didn't want to. So here's the helmet with all of the support material removed, other than it's just right now sitting on the internal support structure. So that is what that looked like. Uh, it's not too bad considering, you know, what it was doing and it was actually not too bad actually getting it off. I mean, in general, this helmet actually, the support material on it was not as bad to remove as I was possibly planning on. Definitely a lot less bloodshed uh, than possibly anticipated. Uh, so the bottom edge is really rough but that's kind of to be expected considering it did print literally like this so this is being completely held up by support material but uh, other than that everything is looking pretty clean. The visor again is a little rough but I'm actually going to take this and all of the other pieces here I'll show you the smaller helmet details, the ears, they're looking really awesome honestly like the support material on these came off pretty easy considering I was kind of worried about the uh, inner ear piece considering how like wrapped around the different areas the support structure was but once I figured out exactly you know what was in and out and how to get it out that was pretty easy to pop out. Same with these ears they pretty much just popped right off. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all of these although not so much these small pieces because they look pretty good so mainly just for the helmet I'm going to go along with my hot knife and try and smooth out these edges a little more so I don't like cut myself on them and just kind of do a little bit of detail work for any place like around right here on the mohawk, maybe a bit on the back of the mohawk. Mm -hmm. On that side, just take the hot knife with a thin tip and just do some detail work and try and smooth stuff out before I actually go ahead and start priming this.
update on what I've got going on. Everything is printed now. I have assembled the chest plate that's the back, uh, glued that together, although I'm going to be reinforcing that, I think, but we will get into that in a second. But pauldrons are printed. They definitely could have turned out better. This is the first one that I printed, and it did a weird little thing on the side where just the shape of the pauldron, it did not like printing. It kept on like hitting it and bending it and did a little bit of weirdness on the inside, which is why those lines are there. And then the seam is what I tried to just sand down a bit. So I flipped uh, the orientation of the pauldron on the print bed because this printed like this, which is why the seam is on the side. So I decided, you know, why not try and print it like this and see if that helps because I thought that basically it was the movement of how it was printing that was making it do that, which almost failed. So I thought, you know, let's rotate it, uh, which I did on this one and it knocked itself, it layer shifted, and I have already cut it where it layer shifted because once it shifted the once, it, it just must have hit itself at some point. I was sleeping when this was printing. Uh, once it hit itself the one point, it then continued and completely finished like to perfection. So I just cut it at the point where it shifted and have since already reassembled it. Uh, to be lined up. So that's why that really nasty seam is there right now, but that's going to be completely invisible once I'm finished with this. Uh, so I'm going to actually JB weld the inside of this pauldron and the chest plate just to fully reinforce it. I'm not like super paranoid. I'm actually way more paranoid about this one because if you can see, I'm going to hold it up to the light. You can see how this is not necessarily lining up too well with with each other so the JB weld on the inside will like fill in that gap and just reinforce it a lot and just for the amount that I'm going to be sanding and like manipulating these pieces I figured just putting a bit of it JB weld on the inside to really reinforce that seam it's going to be worth the you know however a few minutes of my time to do that and the last thing that I actually printed was the mudhorn signet this turned out really well I wanted to get this printed just to see if this this orientation on the print bed and layer height was going to be like high enough quality for me uh, but it looks really nice so as long as I can remove the support material that's all underneath it uh, this is gonna be great and I'm not gonna need to like try and get this resin printed or whatever so yeah I'm gonna see what that looks like but first I'm going to JB weld the insides of these two pieces to today's temporary garage setup. One of the most unprofessional things you'll most likely ever see in your life, but hey, it does work. All I'm gonna be doing is putting some spot putty this stuff on the helmet to try and improve some of the layer lines on this, maybe try and fix up the edges on this thing. And I also brought out the one pauldron because I figured I might as well do that at the same time as well since everything else is still drying.
quick sanded the layer that was on the pauldron just to see how it was turning out and honestly this stuff looks amazing so far. It wasn't completely dried in a few areas so I just decided to let that sit and I know that I'm going to be doing a few layers of the stuff anyway. The uh, helmet is still there untouched but I grabbed some of the small stuff here to actually start filler priming. So I like using this stuff. I go through it like water practically. It is the only stuff that I will use until it gets to the final coat and then I will use like a matte black uh, primer for painting. Uh, but other than that, this is all that gets used. I did manage to get the support material off of the Mudhorn Signet. No problem, this thing looks awesome. So grab that and all of the tiny little helmet details to start priming. been a bit of a setup upgrade. I just figured since I was going to be spending so much of the next few days just trying to finish up all of the pieces to be completely ready to be painted that I might as well like set up a bigger table and just you know set up shop here even better. So I didn't get a chance to film when I originally did this because there was like a crazy power washing going on down the street. Uh, but I did actually do another layer of, or I did the first layer of primer on the helmet because I actually dropped this when I was sanding it. And so it just cracked right here. Uh, so I quickly JB welded the inside and just, you know, I wanted to let that sit so I did not want to work on sanding it again and so I figured I would plop a layer of primer on it just because I also like putting layers of primer on things just to get everything back to one color because it's easier to tell what is still an uneven texture or not. So probably going to do another layer of that but that's what that is looking like but I also sanded the earpieces and everything down sanded that down even more and I've brought the two parts that had JB Weld on them so the other uh, pauldron and the chest plate and I'm going to put the spot putty on those so that they can dry and can be all ready to sand for tomorrow. Just to backtrack for a second here, I ended up grabbing the chest plate before bondoing it because I needed to use it as a bit of a template marker for some modifications that I needed to make to the stomach plate. Mainly these two side sections I just never modified and really I was going to have to do this um, when I had the two pieces in my hand anyway. Pretty much it was just the area where that downward side section on either side came down down and covered the actual end to the stomach plate. Just needed to get rid of that to give it a nice clean line. And I just cut off those extra side sections using my hot knife and then cleaned up the rough edges a little. So I sanded down all of the pieces that had the bondo on them, so the chest plate, and I also wiped them down which is why they look a little wet. So the chest plate is all sanded, the pauldrons are all sanded, and I also sanded the helmet down which I think my next plan of attack is going to be to spray paint those pieces and then put some more Bondo on the helmet as well as the stomach plate that I brought down. Go well, back over here. Uh, this piece, just if I think it needs it or I might just spray primer that as well. Anyway, that's the plan of attack.
So clearly I went a little wild on the Bondo on the helmet, mainly because I am trying to get these pieces ready to be painted in pretty much by this weekend. And the humidity is really not good all weekend. Like technically, I did spray those. Technically the humidity is too high than is recommended for the filler primer. So because I don't know how many layers I'm actually going to be able to do of the filler primer, I decided to try and make up for that with some of the spot putty because that can be done whenever and it's also just going to generally get me there um, to a more finished smooth product at an even faster rate. So that's why the helmet's looking like that but now I think because these guys should all be pretty much dry I'm going to mouse to sand all of those and possibly depending on what they look and feel like put more bondo on them as well by now I'm sure you get the idea of my continuous cycle of bondo filler primer and sanding I already hadn't filmed quite a lot of the post-processing process but for the sake of not boring you all to death I've cut out even more but I did just want to make sure I got across just how much time I spent perfecting these pieces. It was honestly ridiculous. You better believe that when I was finished with this, there was not a single divot, layer line, or anything else noticeable if I could help it. So yeah, that's my little cut summary of the post-processing section. I know at various points in the video I have sort of mentioned a bit of a timeline of wanting to get things finished like by a weekend or whatever, and let me tell you that timeline kept on increasing by literal weeks, so that should give you an idea just how long I spent on these pieces. Hopefully you can hear me with all the chaos going on outside right now, but last night I packed it in pretty early because the Bondo was reacting really strangely to the filler primer that was on this. It was like cracking and doing weird stuff, I'm assuming because the filler primer hadn't set completely. Uh, so I basically spent the night sanding the helmet down. So now I've sanded absolutely everything down. Originally I was thinking about leaving the filler primer on the pauldrons and I did leave the filler primer on the chest plate when I was bondoing it. Uh, but because it does, it's, did so much strange stuff on that, I just sanded everything down. So now I'm going to spray this in more filler primer, the uh, stomach plate, the chest plate, and then I'm going to think about whether I want filler primer on the pauldrons or another layer of Bondo. Hopefully you can hear me with all of the outside noise, but I actually haven't had a chance to work on any of the armor pieces for like the last week or so because the temperature has been too cold or it's been too humid and just hasn't worked out. So today is finally a great day temperature and humidity wise and it's possibly going to be the last day of the season that it's going to be like this. So I need to basically get all of the prep on these pieces done today. So I'm not entirely sure where I left it off the last time so I'm going to show you what they look like and what I still need to do to them. So all of the bigger pieces like the pauldrons and the chest plate, they're pretty good on the big chest plate piece. Um, there's a few little indentation crack things so I'm gonna just perfect all of these pieces with some more Bondo and then sand them down maybe do a spray layer on them and then they should be good to be like primed like for painting like the final layer of paint on them almost before they get uh, their final like best car coat on them. The pauldrons are a little more messy so I think I'm gonna bondo these up a little more but what I need to also start doing is assembling stuff so the mud horn needs to go on this pauldron and I also need to start attaching the ear pieces onto the helmet but I started off by gluing these larger bottom sections of the ear pieces to the actual helmet. Now the entire reason that I needed to do this was because I needed to completely eliminate the seam between the helmet and the pieces themselves. I also just decided to glue on the back vent at the same time while I sort of had the helmet out of commission and could clip that on and let that dry. I also glued on the inner ear pieces just because I wasn't sure how much of those were actually seen from the outside and if I was going to need to hide any of the seams there, which I didn't really need to do, but it wasn't a problem that they were assembled onto the helmet already so that I didn't have to do it later. And then once all of that had dried, of course, it was back to the spot putty to get rid of these side seams. 
They weren't incredibly deep or problematic, so it really wasn't a very time-consuming job, but it was something that was necessary to do for screen accuracy. Once I got a couple of layers of the spot putty on and sanded those down, I then went ahead and attached the outer ear pieces. And here is what the fully assembled helmet base looks like. Attaching the mudhorn signet was a much easier job. All I had to do was make sure that those little dip points could actually go into the holes and glue it on. Because of how the signet is actually added in the show, there is a fairly distinct line between the pauldron and the signet itself. So all of the bondo work has been finished and sanded on the helmet, as well as all of the pieces are now attached. So that is ready to get its hopefully final coats of filler primer on it before it actually gets its finishing paint primer layer. And then I have all of the other pieces all bondoed up. They still need to be sanded, but I also finally printed the last pieces that I need. So these are the belt cylinders that I decided that I only wanted to put three on just for the belt distance of where my cutoff point is. Figured three would be the good number there, as well as the little belt buckle. So gonna have to spray primer those as well and start getting them. I mean, they're pretty simple pieces, so they're not gonna need much work. It's a funny story. I was looking at pictures of the pauldrons and I realized <laughs> that in fact these holes up here should actually be these dome like things which i did have print files for and i just never bothered really looking at what those were so now i have those printed i only need four but i figured they are so tiny that uh i might as well print a couple more just in case i lose them uh so those are all printed now so i'm going to just glue these onto this uh pauldron the pauldrons um, and do a little bit of priming, but they're not too rough, so hopefully, and I don't want to like knock them off accidentally, so it's going to be a delicate process, so it's possibly good that they're not going on until now anyway, but just wanted to let you know that in fact, yes, I am adding the little dome details on the upper mohawk part of the pauldrons. So here are all of the pieces with their latest spray coat. They are looking awesome. So, so smooth. Honestly, these are probably the smoothest props that I've built, um, which is great because they need to be crazy smooth. Um, so they are looking great. Here's the helmet as well. And so what I'm gonna do now is give them one, hopefully one final, a really fine sand to get them extra extra smooth. I'm gonna see what they look like. If they're looking good then they will get primed in their black primer before the black gloss goes on them. If they look a little more rough than I would like then they'll get another layer of the filler primer. So sanding first and then we'll assess the situation. I decided just for uniformity and because they just generally were not looking great on the inside to actually spray the interior of the pauldrons, chest plate, stomach plate in the black primer. There was a lot of discoloration from various things, so just spraying everything black I knew was going to make everything look nice. And then finally, we made it to the stage where I was happy with the smoothness of the props and could therefore continue on with the black primer layer. Now I actually needed all of these props to be black because of the technique that I was going to use for the Beskar effect. But normally, unless it was something like a clone trooper or stormtrooper helmet, like something distinctly white, I would normally spray everything in black anyway, just because I like the look of starting with black. It looks great for weathering and dry brushing and is just my personal preference. And here is what the gloriously smooth helmet now looks like with the black primer on it. And let me tell you, that glorious smoothness did not last long. Pretty much everything went steeply downhill from here thanks to that gloss black spray paint. So because I needed this to be extremely perfectly glossy black, I bought myself two options, that lovely lacquer and then this nightmare. <laughs> So clearly here you can see me using said nightmare on all of the largest pieces that I spent weeks on perfecting. Now I don't know if it was a messed up can or this particular color or whatever, but it orange peeled everything so badly. And it was not me because I could barely like touch the area with paint and it would just look like orange peel. 
So thankfully, after realizing things were not looking great, I ended up switching to the clear lacquer for the pauldrons, which is what I ended up using for everything later. It's awesome stuff. But in between all of the utter turmoil that I was experiencing in the garage, I realized that I really needed to start cracking on the mannequin bust. I ended up finding this male torso on Thingiverse and I cut it down to fit what I thought would be about the right point where I wanted to cut off the bust and then I also decided to get a little fancier and create myself a pole hole for the wooden dowel that I wanted to add to actually hold the helmet on. So here are the actual bust pieces printed. There's the fourth pieces under my desk, I think. Um, but as you can see, they are quite massive and I did have to split them up in quite a few parts. So these two are obviously the top shoulder pieces with the neck. You have the hole that I added so that the pole will just slip into there to actually hold the helmet up, which I also designed a nice little... Uh, holder to have on top of the pole just to stabilize the helmet a lot. Normally I have been using small wood plaques um, as sort of the top part, but they become kind of really hard to find and so I just figured I would design something and I also put the uh, cutout section for the pole so it can just really slide on nicely and I can just glue that and not have to worry about screws and stuff if I don't want to. The bottom section is actually separated into four and right now I only have the front pieces printed because I'm not sure if I'm actually going to bother with the back section because I don't really need it. So basically these pieces, which I'm gonna start gluing this all together after I explain this. This piece it just sits on top of the bottom piece like this. I'm gonna glue this all together and not worry about the seams or anything because really this is just for form and stability to actually dress and you're never going to see the underneath part so any roughness between the pieces is really not going to matter so long as they actually stay together. Um, but obviously it is like cantilevering off the back like crazy here but because the underneath part is like really not going to be seen because of the cape and stuff I'm not actually sure if I'm going to bother with the back pieces or hollow them out more or do something. Not sure, so I'm gonna glue these four pieces that I have together first and then sort of determine what I want to do with the back. the rough bust all glued together. As you can see it is like perfectly uh, sitting fine on its own despite the fact that it's like super cantilevering out the back here um, and because there's so much of this arm hole missing I think I am going to modify the back two pieces try and like hollow them out as best as possible just because it really just does not need um, the weight in the back. It could use this stability because it is, you know, it could tip back even though I really don't think it will because most of the weight of everything is on the front anyhow. Um, so really it's just a stabilization. So I'm going to try and like cut out in like a rectangle or something so that it keeps all of the shape of the outside but doesn't waste any material on the inside. So definitely not the cleanest or prettiest assembly that I've ever done, but it is really, really sturdy and is going to work absolutely perfectly for what I need it for. So that is the entire mannequin underbust piece all put together. The pole itself I haven't trimmed down or anything, I just sort of stuck it in that to align all of the pieces and then just stuck my little pole topper 
um, on top there just to make sure that it all fit and to give myself like a first general concept of what this is actually going to look like. Uh, but now it's actually time to start measuring for the costume pieces. I decided to start off the soft good section of this by templating the belt. Now when you want to achieve screen accuracy, the best thing that you can do is use the actual screen used costume as your immediate reference for templating. So this particular poster of Mando had not only great lighting, but it also had a pretty much dead on look at all of the details on the belt. There's a bit of curve on either end, but for width, this worked great. I already knew that I wanted to work off a two inch belt proportion when I scaled all of the belt pieces for printing. So once I had the entire section that I needed traced out, I then scaled that up to the two inches to then print out at the appropriate scale. Now there's a bit of a jump here because I actually ended up cutting, embossing, and dyeing all of the belt pieces that I needed out of leather before ultimately deciding to switch to remaking everything in vinyl or pleather. There are a few reasons for this, but ultimately it came down to screen accuracy. Even though the belts should be made out of leather, this vinyl that I had left over from other costumes was going to look way more like Mando's belts in terms of texture and thickness. Plus, ultimately, this is just a display piece, so a partial belt being made out of pleather wasn't going to be the end, which is also why I couldn't be bothered to go out and get more accurate leather for a fairly minimal job. I ended up doing pretty much everything the exact same way though, between the actual leather and the vinyl. I marked out all of the embossing details on the pieces before then going over them with my hot knife to actually engrave it into the pleather. It was mostly just the vertical line details along the strap pieces. Once all of that was done, I actually went along the edges with this edge flex stuff, which is what you normally use on the edge of actual leather pieces. And this stuff really helped to darken that slightly lighter edge due to the backing of the vinyl and also just generally make it look a lot more like real leather, therefore improving its screen accuracy. So I did a couple of layers of that on all of the smaller pieces. The only piece that didn't get it was the main belt piece, but only because its edges were getting folded over so you weren't going to see them anyway. The only piece that I still had left to tackle was the little pouch. Now I decided to fully freehand this template just because I really wanted to play around with the sizing because there really is not a great look at the specific size and or detail of this pouch because normally it's wrapped around Mando's shoulder. So actually figuring out the precise measurements of this are very interesting, especially because it does appear to move depending on who is wearing the costume and or just move in general on the belt itself. So I did play around with quite a few measurements just to see what it looked like in comparison with other parts of the belt. And between that, some freehanding and some educated guessing, I ended up finally with a template that I was happy with to then start actually making out of the pleather. And then it was finally on to one of my favorite steps, the painting. I decided to start with airbrushing the belt pieces just because I was working on the belt at this point and I airbrushed them using this liquid chrome paint, 
which I absolutely love. This stuff looks incredible, but I never get that much of a chance to use it because for most Star Wars props, this level of chrome is just too perfect. It's normally too shiny, too metallic, not dirty enough, so I was very happy to be able to use it for these belt pieces. And now it is finally time to start the Beskar. And this time I decided to go with the graphite powder technique. Now actual Beskar is really a Luma Luster paint, but even if I wanted to use it, I can't actually get it imported into Canada. And I have tried to replicate Beskar a few other times with other various techniques to try and replicate the look of that resin-based paint, but the graphite powder technique was by far the technique that I wanted to try out using the most. So the idea is you have a perfectly smooth, shiny black surface that you then rub the graphite powder onto, and this is the effect that you get just after rubbing it on and then buffing it out a little bit. And in person, and I feel like on camera, this stuff looks absolutely incredible. The graphite powder itself is not a super opaque medium, so it ends up being this darker steel color, which is the perfect Beskar color. If anything, it is almost too reflective. But that is something completely on me. I honestly think that I perfected and made the base maybe a little too shiny and I probably should have taken some time to try out a few different layering methods between maybe using a matte black surface or more satin type of surface and not such a high gloss surface because even before I added the graphite powder to it, it was so reflective that you could see reflection in the black. And so when you add the graphite powder, it is very mirror-like. And Beskar does definitely have that reflective look. I just think this could have been toned down just a little. It does look incredible though, and I'm very happy with how all of this turned out. It was so easy, and all of the time that I spent making these pieces just incredibly smooth, paid off, definitely. Rubbing the graphite powder took almost no time at all. I got through all of the pieces in under a couple of hours, I think. And I just applied the powder using some regular cotton balls and then buffed off the excess powder using just one of the like cotton makeup remover pad things. And both of those seem to work out perfectly. I did also grab some Q-tips, but I didn't end up really needing them. I could get into even some of the more tight spaces with the cotton ball without any issue. You will definitely want to use this stuff with gloves though because it is a pretty messy process. I'm glad that I put that mat down because you can see just all the excess graphite powder all over the place and on my gloves. The one thing I will say about the graphite powder is that if you are planning on using it on actual costume pieces that you are planning on wearing, you would probably want to set it. It's not exactly like if you touched it, the graphite powder would come off of the prop immediately, but you can definitely start to see some fingerprints and it will rub off if you really tried to rub it off. So I would just say for the longevity of your pieces, if you were wearing them, spraying it in some sort of fixative or going over it again in a gloss would definitely be helpful in minimizing those fingerprints. For the most part, your fingerprints will almost leave like a tarnished metal look and you can buff it off really easily. It's just eventually it does seem like the black will start to show through more the more the props are sort of manhandled, I guess you could say. And same sort of thing goes for when you're applying the graphite powder. If there's absolutely any imperfections or just anything on the surface in general, if there happens to be like excess oil from your just fingers or touching it or whatever on the surface of the prop, it will most likely show up and the graphite powder will not like sticking to it. Same goes for just any sort of dimples, cracks, spray, um, drips, like literally any imperfection, this stuff because it isn't very uh, opaque and you're literally rubbing it on, it really adheres to all of those imperfections. So thankfully I did not have very many, nothing that you're really going to be able to see unless you're like two millimeters away from the props, but just something to keep in mind if you are going for that absolutely perfect Beskar finish. 
Now I wanted to keep my version of the Beskar armor pretty pristine, but there were some distinct areas that really needed weathering for screen accuracy. Mainly the Mudhorn Signet, because it was welded directly onto the pauldron, it has this sort of scorch marking around the Signet itself, so I just rubbed off the graphite powder with a Q-tip. I also went back and did some detailing work on the belt pieces, mainly the cylinders. The recessed lines around them are definitely darker, so I just went in with a really small paintbrush and painted them black to give those lines nice definition. Now, there's this slight matter of debate as to what exactly is going on with the earpiece coloring, because the upper parts of the earpieces that you can see that I've masked off there appear to be fairly significantly lighter than the rest of the helmet, despite the fact that it should all be sprayed in a Lumaluster, which is a uniform color. So to achieve that strangely more vibrant look on those higher points, I devised a plan. So you saw I masked off all of those areas to then spray those high points in the mirror chrome paint, which I knew was going to be absolutely way too light, but I thought it had the closest coating finish, like that perfect shiny look to the rest of the base coat that it was going to work for the purpose that I had in mind because my next step was to then rub the graphite powder back onto it to deepen it up which it did work I had to like really rub it in there with my hands but this plan did actually turn out perfectly I also went back with a q-tip and just got rid of the graphite powder in the deeper areas which is that like curved part along the upper earpiece and in between that like hollowed out area. So made that darker, made the other parts lighter, and I did the same thing with the Mudhorn Signet because the Signet itself also has a lighter appearance. And then it was on to final armor assembly. So the one piece that I still had left to attach was the stomach plate to the chest plate. I figured it was just going to be easier if I left the two pieces separate to Beskar them up and then attach them afterwards. And then finally, it was on to the visor installation. Now, this is a step that I would normally do before definitely any painting, but normally, possibly before any final priming, but I had a plan and then I backpedaled. So my usual visor technique is to first create a template with some tracing paper, just tracing along the insides of where the visor actually is in the helmet. Mando's helmet has these really inset cheekbone pieces, so you want to make sure that the helmet is sitting nicely on the inside against those. So I then cut out my tracing paper template and retrace it onto some nice thick cardstock because the cardstock is going to bend more similarly to the welding visor. So it's not going to bunch up and do any weird things. If it's going to sit flat, it will sit flat. If there are any problems, you're going to find out with this paper, which is a lot better than finding out there's an issue with the actual visor itself. So just pop that template back into your helmet to double check that everything fits nicely. Now my preferred method for Mandalorian visor installation is to use these T-nuts and in Mando's helmet's case also some Chicago screws because the T-nuts are too big when you get closer to the bottom of the middle visor portion. And I just end up JB welding those on the inside at various key points. And once those have set, I then take my template and put it back into the visor and make marks for where those points actually are. And once I've got those points figured out, it's finally time to trace the template on to the welding visor. Also making sure to mark where all of those holes are on the visor itself. The whole points always end up needing modification later, but it's better to have a rough idea of where those points are than to have no reference point at all. I then just like to burn those whole portions out with my hot knife. It's very easy to make the modifications necessary for the visor to fit well with a hot knife with one of these fine points because this is a very sort of finicky process getting all of the holes to line up with the posts and having everything fit nicely. I always leave the bottom portion of the T visor longer until I actually have the fitting of the holes figured out before then cutting it to the size that it actually needs to be. And once all of the trimming and fitting is finished, it is time to finally remove the plastic overlay on either side of the welding visor. 
And the final step is of course the actual installation of the visor. I end up using these various plastic spacers and washers just to help the visor lay flatter against the side of the helmet and also just help any possible holes if they're too big. You don't want the visor to actually pull away from the screw or anything. And then finally actually screwing the visor into the helmet itself. I also ended up having to make some not too pretty modifications to the mannequin portion. The neck muscles were just always too much for the look of Mando, so I knew I was getting rid of those anyway, but I also found out the hard way that the pauldrons didn't exactly fit on his shoulder muscles, so made some pretty heavy modifications to either shoulder to trim those down so that the pauldrons fit nicely. I then just filled in all of the gaps with duct tape so that none of the plastic cut anybody and or stuck to any of the fabric and made holes in that and just generally made it slightly better looking. And the final step for this Mandalorian bust is actually dressing the mannequin. If you've been watching my channel for a while now, you will know that my partner in crime is in charge of all of the sewing stuff, which is my mother. <laughs> So I basically have a highlight reel of a bunch of the different stuff that she did for all of the costume pieces, starting off with the cape. For the cape, I actually ended up buying a wool army blanket that worked out perfectly. It's really close to exactly the right material. It was the perfect color and you can see here she's already done a bit of work with shaping that cape and is now working on the various pleats and sort of figuring out the shape that the cape needs to be. While I did want this bust to be screen accurate, I was perfectly fine with cheating a bit in the costume department of things. So the flight suit itself is almost like a covering over the bust and the vest has essentially no back. So it has all of the correct detail in the front, but the straps end nowhere. And it also has these longer sides that just wrap around that then get hidden by the cape in the back. So essentially everything is still accurate. The vest just has no back and the flight suit of course ends pretty much at the very top of the shoulder. My mom is also used to doing screen accurate stuff. So she was doing her own research for these costume parts. So all of the paneling is accurate. And then she of course put on that very distinctive stitching on all of the pieces as well. Next, she added the collar to the flight suit portion of the costume and then added all of the crazy stitching on the collar as well. We debated a bit whether we should add it or not, but I realized that you are going to probably see the different stitching panel areas in the back. Plus, as I mentioned to her, even if you can't see much of it, there's going to be video footage to actually showcase all of this work that you put into it. She also got all of the belt pieces that I cut out finished and sewn together and then it was up to me to do the last finishing touches which was just adding the little buckle portion in the right area and also we decided that it was going to be the easiest to just glue on the pouch. And once all of the sewing was done it was back to me to put the finishing touches on everything and assemble it all. Starting with getting the chest plate attached to the vest. Now, normally you would attach chest plates and chest armor to flak vests with Velcro, but because this was a stationary bust, we just decided to forego the extra step of adding the Velcro and trying to get it all lined up and just have me hot glue it straight onto the vest, which ended up working out perfectly, even if it did offend most of my mother's sewing sensibilities. Next, it was on to actually gluing the flak vest onto the mannequin. I didn't really glue the flight suit itself onto the plastic bust. It was a pretty tight fit anyway, so it was just gluing the ends of the straps down and the ends of the vest down and wrapping those around and getting everything to fit nice and snugly. Next was the belt, so it did get glued directly on to the chest plate, and then the upper part of the belt just got glued around the back. The bottom, my mom actually sewed down just because we thought it would be the best option there, just so that it fit nice and flush with the edge of the vest. And then finally, it was attaching the pauldrons to the sides of the flight suit. And here's what the mannequin looks like with everything glued down minus the cape because the absolute final step to the costume part of this was trimming the length of the cape to match the end of the bust. 
the cape front itself is actually just tucked under the flak vest as it is in the costume and it makes it sit perfectly fine there so I didn't need to add any glue to that. It's nice and tight, isn't going anywhere, and it also gives me the opportunity to play around with the fabric and move it around at different points if I want to. And the final bit of construction was cutting the pole down to size and adding the pole cap so that the helmet can sit on top nicely. And here is the finished Mandalorian bust. 